Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 314, the We're Finally Back from a Holiday and Vacation edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 16th of August, 2017. Okay, we want, do want to thank our fans for holding out for a week. Uh, George took vacation last week. Gavin was traveling. And uh, here at the office at Anglican TV Central, we've been having um, internet troubles. Uh, for some reason, just you know, for a whole hour, the internet will just completely shut off. I'll call Optimum, the provider. Hey, come on out. Take a look at my internet. Something's wrong. By the time they get here, everything's working just perfectly. And it's hard to say, well, it might be spiritual warfare to IT professionals. They just, what? What do you mean? What's that? <laughs> so uh, the, the problem remains. And so we hopefully can have a good recording here with Gavin as we talk about the latest Anglican news. Um, let's start with the first story. Uh, it happened right as you were leaving. And the Church of England, if you look at it from a secular um observation or a christian observation you would say two lesbian clergy people got married at a church of england service with the eucharist and dancing afterwards if you ask the participants or the person presiding over it oh, how dare you say that of course it wasn't that we were just honoring a civil union between between two people at a church service um, and so I go, I got to get Gavin on the phone here and see what really happened. Um, Gavin, was there a, um, a honoring of a civil union or was there a wedding in the Church of England? Uh, yes and no, Kevin. <laughs> what we're looking at. <laughs> How English of us. <laughs> oh, oh I, think, I, think, I think Jesus called it something else. Yes. Um, what we're looking at is how Justin Welby's radical inclusion works out in practice in the Church of England. Because the people who've been radically included are, as you say, two lesbian clergy women. One of them is a senior member of the Southwark Diocese. She's the DDO, the Director, uh, Diocesan Director of Ordinance. It's her job to discern whether or not the Holy Spirit is calling someone to holy orders. Lots of holiness in here. Mm -hmm. Holiness appears to break down when the woman DDO uh, gets partnered by another woman priest in the diocese who's an incumbent. And they keep the rules because everyone knows how important it is to keep the rules on the surface while doing the opposite underneath. They keep the rules by not having a formal wedding. But what they have is a civil partnership. So they take their civil partnership, which is allowed in the Church of England, so long as you promise that uh, your cuddles are platonic. And um, uh, don't, don't even go there. I, I, I <laughs> who would ever want to ask those kind of questions? Anyway, yep. if you promise that your cuddles are platonic, uh, like Geoffrey John, the Dean of St. Albans, you can, you can live with the, the person you love of the same sex. Uh, what they did was they went to Southwark Cathedral and they had a Eucharist to celebrate their love match and their living together. And after the Eucharist, they then had dinner and dancing in the cathedral to celebrate this in a radically inclusive way. The problem with radical inclusion like this and the... Like, you froze, so I'll say it again. Or I yeah, please, yeah, it repeat. The trouble with radical said, in, yes, that's the part. Go, the trouble go with, for it. The, the, the trouble with radical inclusion like this is that it looks very much like hypocrisy. Mm. It looks like you're doing one thing and you're saying another. So the Church of England is saying, well, this isn't a wedding, this isn't a wedding reception. But what it's doing is a wedding and a wedding reception. Uh, at this point, radical inclusion looks really hypocritical. And you have to look into the Gospels and see what attitude Jesus took to hypocrisy to have some sense, I think, of what this looks like to, to uh, people who look at it through the eyes of the New Testament. 
Well, G- Justin Welby was you know, quick to say, you know, right after the last general said it, we're not changing our doctrine, people. Settle down. It's not a big deal. But when I look at uh, Jesus' teaching in the gospel, Jesus had no trouble with the law, his trouble with um, the practice. You guys don't understand it. You go through the Beatitudes. You know, you guys don't understand this at all, do you? You know, and that was the the big issue, and it's now a big issue again. I yeah, your doctrine's fine, but your practice is, you know, hypocritical at at the very least. Uh, the other side of satanic, if you want to get official, you know, and so you're, I, you know, you're you're sieving gnats and you're swallowing camels, you're keeping the rules of general synod. But actually, you're practicing lesbian marriage and having celebrations of it in the Holy Sanctuary during the Eucharist. I think the problem with this, at this point, Kevin, we actually find an example of the thing that I think is going to kill the Church of England. Uh, you know, hypocrisy stinks in any organization. It's especially bad when it's rank in the church. But what we're having here, I think, is an Archbishop of Canterbury who is lulling people into a sense of false security, saying there will be no changes to official doctrine. And, you know, I dare say he's telling the truth. I don't think there will be changes to official doctrine. What there will be changes to is official practice. (laughs) And this is an example of practice that is completely antithetic to doctrine. Now, to to hold these two contradictory things today, to get together and say this is radical inclusion, I think takes a particularly odd frame of mind. It's not a frame of mind that sits very easily with the injunctions and the dynamics of the New Testament. I think is a very serious error. And actually, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very pleased with these two women that they, they like, like each other and they uh, look after each other. I, I think, you know, that can be great. But I don't think it's what clergy and holy orders are called to do. And I certainly don't think it's what a cathedral should be, should be used to celebrate. But the bigger problem is that it's a microcosm of an issue that will, I think, sink the Church of England. If the Church of England doesn't have integrity, it doesn't have very much. Hmm. All right. I think we've hit them hard enough. <laughs> we'll have to see. I mean, that's the the hardest part of this program is, you know, we are uh, not here to just be critics of the church. We're here to bring good news. We're here to be transparent about the news and to bring you hope in the church. Um, when we talk about things that are going bad in the church, we also get to talk about things that are going good in the church, and there's lots of good news as well. Um, I don't know if we'll talk about any today. Uh, what else is happening over there? I, I took some notes in our pre-show, but... No, we, uh, will, we will talk about some good news. <laughs> um, I don't have my notes. It, I don't know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me give them to you verbally, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Because I remember. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, this is this wonderful organization, Christian Concern. Um, mm-hmm. I have to say, I've just I've just been to a, the synod of the uh, no, no, the Nordic Catholic Church, and clergy came running up to me to say they were so nice to me. They said, "We see you talking to Kevin, and we think the show that Kevin runs is just great." <laughs> and so, you, well, are you thank you for the that? compliment. I appreciate it. Uh, you know. I, very touched um and but they also really love christian concern and they follow christian concerns defense of christian witness very carefully so let's move on to christian concern there's a very nice man called ian sleeper ian runs a curry house and uh, the people he gets to cook in his curry house are muslims because almost certainly muslims cook the best curries and in talking about the faith of ian's a christian they're practicing muslims he discovered they hadn't read the Quran. So when he told them what was in the Quran and what he found difficult about it, they were horrified. <laughs> they said, is this stuff really in the Quran? And he said, yes, you you, you guys should actually read the Quran. Okay, you froze for a second uh, there. Uh, uh, you yeah, froze for one repeat. second. So back to where you should read the Quran. So um, he decided to take a placard into London saying, uh, love Muslims, hate Islam, and and watch out, you know, things are coming. And um, he's very fond of his Muslim stuff. He really does love them. (laughs) But he's very worried about Islam. And apparently after he'd explained the verses in the Quran to him that were behind terrorism, they were worried about Islam too. The police saw him with this placard saying, love Muslims, hate Islam, and they arrested him. 
They didn't just arrest him, they took him to prison and held him for 13 hours, which is quite a long time. In the past, they've held Christian evangelists without food or water or conversation. I don't know how, what his circumstances were. Then they put him on bail for six weeks. So for six weeks, the, he was waiting to discover whether he would be prosecuted under the uh, section of the act he was arrested by. They decided in the end not to prosecute him. In other words, he hadn't done anything wrong or anything against the law. So mm -hmm. and, Andrea Minchella Williams, who's the uh, chief executive of Christian Concern, says that, that the police in this country need training. They, they need to be moved away from political correctness and to understand that the law actually still offers some modicum of relief to Christians as they, as they witness for their faith. And I think this is one of the things that we, we're facing. We're, actually, it's not, it's not totally dissimilar to the last issue. We have the technicalities of the rules, which say this man didn't break any law. And we have the way in which society actually works, which is police don't like Christian preachers and lock them up. <laughs> well, <laughs> really, well, I don't know that. Until, well, they, until they give proper legal advice and discover that they weren't breaking the law. Our good friend Richard Dawkins... Uh, ran into this himself as well. He was going to be interviewed on a local radio station here in California. And uh, I, apparently this is what you do before you have a, a guest on, is you, sw you search his Twitter feed. They were so happy. He was anti-Christian. He was an atheist. He had a great following. But they found uh, two tweets going back about four years where he was <clears throat> critical of Islam. And uh, all of a sudden, he got a, a phone call saying, we can't have you on because you hate Islam. And he uh, gave an interview and said, how come I can be critical of Christianity, but I cannot be critical of Islam? And that's just what's happened out there in, in, in all of the, our society, especially in the Western culture. If the Christian man had the, the placard that said, uh, love Muslims, hate Islam, uh, and he was standing next to a Islamic person who said, uh, love Brits and hate Christianity. Well, <laughs> only one's going to be arrested. And that's just the way it, it goes for that, you know, for a while. And one of the things I've been trying to, to explain uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the kind of public discourse, I, um, particularly when I was working in a university, was to say that this is a three cornered fight mm -hmm. uh, between Christianity, the historic culture of, of, of Europe and the free world. Uh, Islam and secularism and uh, secularism has started attacking Islam and weakened it very badly uh, and it, it doesn't mind because it doesn't like Christianity at all and it, it would like it destroyed but secularism because it is religiously illiterate doesn't understand Islam at all uh, and doesn't understand that by weakening Christianity uh, it will strengthen Islam it also thinks that the moment Muslims um, go shopping and enjoy the internet and enjoy the fruit of a secular lifestyle, they'll give up on Islam and Islam will die because they're religiously illiterate and they don't understand Islam. What's actually happening is that Christianity is being weakened by secularism. Secularism will then be overcome by Islam. Uh, and, and in this scenario, uh, Islam wins. The only solution to Islam is Christianity. The only thing that holds Islam in its place is the picture of a God who is who is more lovely, more kind, more generous, more forgiving, more who, who, who loves us more than he judges us. Um, so Dawkins has just woken up to this. He, he used to say at one point, <laughs> no. I, I, I don't like Christianity very much, but at least they don't bomb you. <laughs> well, that's what he said. He said, both Bill Meyer, who's a HBO commentator, and the atheist Richard Dawkins say uh, Christianity is the only counterpoint to r radical Islam. Yes. All right. Well, good. You're halfway there. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, it's not impossible that the that, that Dawkins may s may sit down and actually use his splendid brain to think. Um. Uh, Skype just censored what you said about Richard. Why don't we try that we're one more time? <laughs> <laughs> well, someone certainly censored it. Uh, it may be that Dawkins will sit down and use his splendid brain to think more more than about biology and realize that actually uh, his greatest danger is not Christianity, but it's Islam. And, and if he thought the, the very values of Christianity gave birth to the science he practices, this is a dog he hasn't joined up yet. It's not too late. 
it's it's possible that if we speak cogently enough into the public space, we may be able to sway simple intellectuals uh, uh, along rather like um, people like Roger Scruton are, are really trying to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually Christianity is something that should have their support and their friendship because it, it actually is something that will defend them. All right. I, I remember we had three different stories. Uh, please tell me you remember <laughs> what the last one was. <laughs> Well, we have a kind of we have a, fun, a nice, light-hearted, funny one, uh, okay. which has. We, to we've do- got to make it quick because people are going to start dropping off here. Going to get hit that okay. seventeen-minute mark, and people go. <sighs> <laughs> so, what do you got? Uh, Ang- Anglicanism with Christianity has always had a rough relationship with music. Hmm. Uh, music is its own deity, its own god. It easily becomes an end of it. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's my favorite song it's from somebody who wants to sell me at least a warranty of some sort I like having fun with these uh, hello hello mm. oh well I could have got a warranty who wants to spike your, your PC that's right there's <laughs> uh, a vicar in London who's taken over a very famous church uh, it's a church where several musicians are buried. It's called St. Sepulchre's in central London. Uh, he, it's an HTB plant. For those who know, HTB is a big charismatic church that birthed Alpha. And they've put a, a nice clergyman in there uh, to, to, to bring the church to life. But it's a church that was used for as a rehearsal room for musicians. And so when he went in there in 2013, uh, he promised them that they would still have access to the to the church but actually it's grown as a church and he now uses it for christian things and slowly but surely he's had to say to the musicians i'm sorry we're using the church for jesus the musicians are outraged <laughs> and so the, uh, the, uh, the 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 man who writes nice carols john rutter who's nine, known for nice tunes but not his love of jesus has started a, a petition uh, and so has stephen isolis the cellist and um, the petition is to try and get this clergyman to change his mind to love music more than Jesus, I, I expect it won't work. But it's um, it's an example of tensions that the churches have all over the place. Yeah, I mean, we've run into this many times. And in my travels, and some people aren't going to like me saying this, I've run into people where the prayer book was their idol, or the yes. hymnal was their idol, or praise music was their idol, um, or the or, choir, or, the choir, yeah, the or choir. candles. Um, or the and, or- but you know, and, oh yeah, the organ. Oh my lord, what is the thing with organs? And so, why should um, we feed the poor? We can spend a million dollars on restoring an organ. <laughs> and you know, I'm like, yeah, it's okay if Jesus is your idol. You know, just yeah, but uh, it, it is what it is. Um, well, that is a good episode we put together. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. This was episode 316 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless you, and especially any musician enjoying the show. Oh, yeah, I got the guitar. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm off to sing opera this week. <laughs> Ooh.